What's going on guys? My name is Lewis Beck and I'm an instructor with 343 Labs. We are a music production school in located in New York City, specifically in downtown Manhattan. And uh, this is going to mark the final day in our series of kind of like educational production uh, lectures and lessons. And uh, today what I'm going to be doing is, is I'm going to be making a song from scratch with a time limit. So I'm going to be basically producing for uh, an hour and I'm going to try to make a complete song in that period of time. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to walk you through, you know, the different thought processes that I'm going through, the different production techniques that I'm using. As you can see, I'm using Ableton. Uh, but before I do that, you know, big thanks to Splice TV for hosting us. Uh, really, really excited to be a part of this channel. And uh, a warm hello to Everywhere Man 94 and SLE's R, as well as Max Wild Music. And he is the owner of our great school. Runs an awesome ship over here. And uh, just to give you a little bit of information about myself, uh, I'm 27 years old. I grew up in New York City. I've been producing music since I was 16. I started DJing when I was 15. I started playing guitar when I was 11. Um, I've worked in the house and techno sphere for a while, but lately I've been branching off into a more indie electronic kind of area. And actually on that note, today marks a very exciting day for me because I just launched a new project and released a new single under the name Sylvan Paul. And uh, the song is called Fuck the Pain Away. It's a cover of the uh, legendary rave classic by Peaches, by the same title, of course. All right, so... Uh, just real quick, I also wanted to give a little bit of a plug for some of the events that we have going on at the school coming up this week. Uh, we have a great free session that you can tune into with Daltrek, who's an amazing producer and educator that works with us. And uh, of course, we offer online classes, uh, even you know despite the pandemic that's going on. You know, and on that note, I hope that everyone who's tuning in right now is staying very safe and healthy. Anyhow, let's. Um, Let's go ahead and get started. And yes, Lie Society, I agree. Peaches is definitely one fun girl. So this might be a little different than from certain, certain streams that you've seen before with production because I work outside of the box a lot. What I mean by that is I have tons of outboard synthesizers and I use drum machines. And as you can see in front of me, I have my TR-8 from Roland sitting in front of me. And I come into my computer through a universal audio interface, but I hit that with um, some real analog preamps just to give things some juice and some color. So I'm gonna go ahead and start by uh, making a beat, but just real quick before I do that, I want to see if uh, maybe anyone had a BPM that they wanted to throw in for me to work at. So I'll just give that a sec. One hundred. All right, Gabriel Rain. Gabriel Rain. 100 is a great BPM. I have been very into 100 lately, so I appreciate you doing that, man. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just start with a snare drum. Why? Well, under normal circumstances, maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I'd try to come up with some sort of groove element or a melodic thing. But since I'm going against the clock here, you know, and the clock is ticking, uh, what I'm going to look for really is just some sort of basic element for me to start producing around. And drums are always a good place to start because it's just rhythm, right? So I don't need to do the entire rhythm section. All I need is just something to hold time for me. You know, it's like, I don't like, I don't, since I play live instruments, I don't like playing into a metronome. It's kind of this like lax feel. So I like to create at least like my own kind of custom metronome by creating drums, right? So as you can see, I'm working in session view. And I'm going to start out working in session view, but I'm definitely going to transition into arrangement view because after all, we are trying to build a whole song. So, without further ado, let's just get started. Great, so... This is my TR-8 right now. Let me know if you guys can see that all right. If at any point, you know, it becomes an issue with what I'm doing, if you can't make it out clearly, just drop something in the chat and I'll readjust the camera a little bit. 
So right now what I'm doing is I'm actually reaching over to my preamp on the left and I'm turning down the gain a little bit so I can lower that noise floor. As you probably heard, it got super noisy when I turned it on. And I'm gonna go ahead and choose a rim snare for my TR-8. I'm gonna choose the 707 because it's nice and vibey and chill. And I'm looking out my window right now into the courtyard in my apartment building and the sun is setting and it's a very beautiful vibe. So I'm gonna try to make something a little bit, you know, chill. All right. Now I have my TR-8 connected to Ableton via MIDI, a real MIDI cable. And I use a MIDI interface to sync everything up. The reason that's helpful is I don't have to press play and try to get it to sync with the program. I just hit play in Ableton and then there we go, it's playing. Now that reverb is built into my TR-8 and so is that delay. So if I turn down the delay, I just get that little rim snare. But I kind of like that delay. So maybe what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna sequence it off so that it only plays on the first one like this. Yeah, I dig that. So I'm gonna go ahead and label this rim snare. And I'm a huge proponent of labeling, right? Whenever I'm talking to my students about things that are little teeny things that are gonna help their workflow and things that are gonna help them become better producers, um, honestly, labeling one of the number one things. Great, so that's all I need. And since it started a little bit late, I'll just come in right here. And then I'll just, all I need is two bars to work with. So, and I'll just make sure that's in time. And it looks, probably because we're streaming, it's a teeny little bit of latency. So I'm just gonna drag that onto time very, very quickly and easily by warping it and dropping it right in there. So next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, uh, create a custom 808 from my TR-8 right here. And so in case you don't know, the TR-8 is a drum machine from Roland and it houses all of their classic drum machine sounds. So if you're maybe not so familiar with outboard gear, you know, and look what an 808 is really and what a 909 is or 707 or 606 or 505 or all those things, you know, and you see those words sometimes in sample packs and you're like, what does that mean? I don't, I don't, I don't know what that is. Why are they all just arbitrary numbers? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that back in the day in like the 80s, um, all of these drum machines came out that had these unique, interesting sounds. So the 808 is built into this, as is the 909 and the 707. So I love this as a drum machine because it gives me access to all those classic electronic sounds right at my fingertips instead of having to go dive for samples that I want to find to make them work. So I'm going to go ahead and program an 808 in here on the downbeat. And let's see how that sounds. So I'll give it a little more release time. Yeah. And the cool thing is, is that since I'm bringing it in through an analog, since I'm bringing it in through an analog uh, pre preamp, one of the cool things about a preamp is that you can create normal distortion, or rather I should say natural distortion and natural uh, saturation by overdriving the preamp on the way in. So that's what I'm gonna do. Instead of using a distortion plugin, I'm just gonna crank the input and get it really juicy. Go ahead and record that in. And I know what you might be thinking to yourself, but you said, hey, aren't we gonna be making chill vibes today? Why are you coming in with this distorted 808? Well, what I'm gonna end up doing is building something around that that's really chill. But right now I'm just creating kind of the you know basic structure of my track. So 
right there, I just did a little live performance on the drum machine, right, and added in a final note that I could have included in there just to, you know, make the groove a little more interesting so it's not so repetitive. Now, I have to go ahead and loop this section. Great, there we go. And so, even though I'm, you know, creating these sounds naturally and organically from myself, from my own, you know, sources, I still like to use Ableton to create cooler and more interesting sounds. So one of the things I'm going to try to do today is avoid using too many third party plugins because, you know, I've been doing this for a really long time. I make a living doing this. And so I have access to certain expensive tools that you might not. So I want to try to at least when we're working in the box, make it so that you could replicate what I'm doing at home pretty easily. So I'm going to drag on this plugin called erosion to my 808, which is one of my favorite, favorite plugins. It's kind of like a combination of a noise generator with a bit crusher. And before I do that, I'm also going to save, which is so important, right? So I'll just call this Splice Vibe. Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that mind money magic. Um, maybe if you're just, you know, getting tucked in for bed, you could use this. I promise it's going to end up being a chill track. You can just use this to uh, space out and help you pass out. All right, anyhow. Yeah. Create a little bit of you know, dustiness. One thing I'm doing right here is I'm, is that the the filter that's built into Ableton is uh, really really cool because it actually models analog style filters which allow you to overdrive them and create saturation. In case you can't tell already, I love saturation and distortion, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. There we go. And now I'm gonna go ahead and use my send. to some reverb well, my plan top to bottom mind money magic is I am just creating <laughs> I'm creating a, uh, a track start to finish so by the end of this there should be a complete track and it should be pretty vibey um, and yes pirate radio NYC as you forgot or as you mentioned <laughs> I need to submit that mix to my manager so Glad that he chose this time to tell me that. All right, well now I'm gonna reach over and use a synth that is made by the company Korg called the Minilog. A message from YouTube saying, don't I put a limiter on the master? Okay, that's a really great question. So, absolutely not. Uh, I actually, in addition to you know being a producer, uh, I'm a mixing and mastering engineer. And, uh, you know, so I make a living doing that as well. And I'm a huge proponent of not mixing into a limiter. Some people are. Um, what I do instead is literally what I just did, is I'm just going to lower the volume of everything. And the thing is with clipping is that when you're starting out the project, like you obviously don't want to be clipping, but unless you're hearing the artifacts of clipping, while you're producing, it's not necessarily that big of a deal. Obviously, it's a better idea overall to be not clipping so that you don't have to then fix that headache later in the production. But um, you definitely do not want 
to, uh, you definitely do not want to mix into a limiter. Here's the reason why. Uh, if you plan on getting it mastered, then when you take the limiter off, your track is going to sound very different, right? And you're gonna be like, whoa, why does everything sound so, you know, flat and not powerful? So my recommendation always to students, and I do this for myself too, is make it as good as possible without um, using a limiter because then the mastering engineer will be able to really spice it up. All right, so I'm gonna be using, like I said, the mini log. And I also have that routed into my uh, preamp and I'm using a universal audio 4710D Twinfinity for any of you audio nerds out there that are curious. All right, and here we are. So I'm gonna go ahead and program a sound from scratch. There we go, that's our default patch. And what's cool is, is I also have all of my synths, my whole studio, is actually run through one MIDI, giant MIDI clock. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is load up an external MIDI instrument and select the channel where I have my mini log coming in. And now what I can do is, is I can actually control it like it's a virtual instrument. So I can create MIDI and do all the editing in the computer, but then I get this really dope, full sounding analog sound. So what I actually might do right now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna experiment with playing a little bit on the keyboard, and if I can't find something that I like, I might just draw something in real quick, because I happen to be very familiar you know, with like key structure and uh, the way that the piano roll is laid out. Sounds like my 808 right now is doing the note E. So I'm gonna treat that as my root note. So I'm gonna work in the key of E. An external mid external MIDI instrument is just because I recorded it doesn't mean that that's the sound all I did was record the actual MIDI information right so what I can now do is, is I can play this back and now I can actually design the sound just like if I was doing it digitally do is now something that I tend to do when I work because of my analog workflow where I don't know exactly how the track's going to be laid out yet right so what I'm going to do is I'm going to record about 32 bars of me just kind of jamming with the modulation on this synth so that I can get some sections that I might want to use
I like to do. actually kind of imagine parts of the song that are more high energy and so I like to actually kind of perform in moments where I open up the filter more and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the start of the song go ahead and look into my audio that I just recorded now this just did me a really you know this was super helpful because now I have all of this stuff that I can work with right so I'm gonna go ahead and for now just go to this last section I recorded because I really was digging that vibe let's see was it right here yeah I'm gonna get a little weird with it. Uh, thank you, Mind Money Magic. I appreciate that. So, in terms of the modulation on that track, what I actually have the way it's set up is I have it so that the cutoff is starting at a high rate and then slowing down a little bit to a slower rate. So then it's then like it's going and then kind of like morphing. So I love to use live drums in my recordings. I am not a good drummer, but I love the tone of drums. And so I don't even own a full drum set. I just own a hot, two hi-hats and two snares. And so I'm gonna go ahead and actually record a hi-hat pattern in manually instead of drawing it in. I'm gonna do that using a microphone from the company called a company called Telefunken, which is a really legendary microphone company. And one of the things that I love about their microphones and about this microphone in particular is it's a tube microphone. Now, for those of you that are a little bit newer to music production, or maybe just you know newer to the world and aren't as familiar with analog gear, what a tube microphone is is it's known really for its smoothness, right? So especially for recording a hi-hat, this is really, really useful because hi-hats can be really kind of sharp and harsh. And so what this is gonna do is it's gonna give me a really smooth signal. I just got this one drum stick, I got the other one back there, but for now, all I need is that one. All right. So let me go ahead and set this up. Dope. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit record and try to kind of figure out what the vibe is while I'm doing it. Especially some kind of, you know, strip for time. that last thing that I was doing there that kind of like swingy offbeat groove so let's see what that sounded like let's see how bad I am with the drums because I'm not gonna pretend like I'm a drummer <laughs> That 
that's the spot. I really like that groove. So I'm gonna go ahead and make the whole world think that I'm an amazing drummer and warp this. do that is I'm only gonna actually warp the downbeats but in order to do that I'm gonna need to kind of prepare everything and I'm gonna put it into complex mode just so that I can preserve the fidelity of the recording since it is after all live and I really want to make sure it sounds nice so let's see <laughs> now the cool thing about swing right is that swing is always kind of dependent upon uh, where the downbeats actually fall to give you the feeling for swing. So once these downbeats are sorted out and they're all on beat, it actually, the, the swing is just gonna feel a little bit off kilter and interesting as opposed to just wrong, which like I did before. And now I should tell you, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, right? I see that I got 33 minutes left. Things are about to start moving a lot quicker. This is just me laying the groundwork for everything. Let's see, so I might be able to actually figure out what the swing is. One of the things I love about Ableton is you can get so precise with the, uh, the values down here. That one's a little late. two on. So I'm going to go ahead and just for the sake of time, only worrying about getting this first one right since it is after all the same groove. And I can hear that this shuffle right here is the same as right here. So I'll just go ahead and kind of see where these are. So okay, so this is falling right there. This is falling right there, so I need to make sure that I'm falling onto the third quarter note over here. Which I am, and that's just a little bit off right there. Okay, so that explains it. Beautiful. All right. So now I got a basic drum layer, right? And so the last thing that I'm gonna go ahead and do in terms of recording with a microphone for now is I'm gonna go ahead and move my room around a little bit. And I'm actually gonna pull out my acoustic guitar. Now, I am by trade a guitar player and a synth designer. I would say those are my two real strengths as a musician. As you can see, I pretend to play the drums, but Ableton luckily allows me to make it seem like I'm actually pretty decent. I'm gonna go and set up this microphone to be able to record my acoustic guitar. When 
what I'm planning on doing is just arpeggiating what was going on uh, on the mini log. Let's have a look. Make sure I tuck in my necklace. That's probably the vibe I'm going to be going for. The tone sounds nice. It's going to turn up the preamp a little bit. So I come in a little bit hotter, more level. All right, let's go ahead and get going with that. So that is a, oh, I see, C major seven right here. I was thinking it was a D. All right. Towards the end, I think I found the groove a little bit. Let's jump in there. Great, so there we go. I got my loop. Homemade is the best part. So let's hear this all together now. I hear that the guitar is clashing with the chords in terms of just frequencies. And that was on the wrong channel. And you can see all that bulkiness down there. I don't need that from the guitar. I just want the nice crispy stuff. Also EQ a little bit of the mini log out in that same area. That should make it a little more manageable. Better yet, actually. If I also throw on a little teeny bit of multiband compression, I know I said I was going to use only Ableton plugins, but this is the one exception because this multiband compressor from FabFilter is the best. I'm just going to use it to grab those peaks at the start so I can hear that guitar chord more cleanly. High ratio so it really grabs right at it and I'm going to have my release be long so it presses it down. And now I want 
those guitars to be out wide, or that guitar rather. So I'm going to go ahead and use a really cool trick called the Haas effect. Now the Haas effect is where you take a delay, you put it into um, time mode, right, milliseconds mode, turn it all the way up to 100% wet, and you slightly delay one side. And now check this out. So we're right out there in our face. And I'll go ahead and throw the EQ3 on. And I'm going to add a little sparkle on top. Cool. So for me, I have enough to work with now where I'm going to actually transfer this over to my arrangement view just so I can start trying to arrange this out. And so I know that, at least for my style, I like to start with just these chords. They're really chill. And I'll bring the drums in right away. So one of the things about the way that I produce is like I come up with an idea, right, and I think it's great, and then I realize as I add more that I don't like it. So I'm going to go ahead and just take away that LFO nonsense on the 808. It's too distracting at this point. I want it to just stay nice and deep. So maybe I'll get these guitars coming in now over here. So let's go, I'm going to go ahead and I'll loop this area so I can figure out what more I want to add. And I'm actually thinking that I'm going to add in a little bit of like an electronic hi-hat to layer in with the hi-hats that I already have going. My live hi hat. I love creating blends of live and electronic. That's kind of like my signature thing that I do. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly record that. a little bit so I have a little bit of space to play with and then I'll come in and record that now so that's just the 909 closed hat so I abbreviate that CH So as you could hear, that was a little bit off. But that's actually not that much of a problem because I'm just going to warp it. And we'll be right on time. So all that's got to do is hit on those eighth notes cleanly and we should be good.
create some cool motion. I'm going to uh, I'm going to pan my uh, electronic hi hat to the right and have my live hi hat straight down the middle, so they create this cool kind of conversation. Here's the thing, that's my whole groove. Now just so I can show off a little bit more of my gear, what I am gonna do is I'm gonna record a very simple bass line from my Moog Voyager, which is a legendary vintage analog synth that I have hanging out right over there. Yeah, some breeze effects could be definitely interesting to use. I might just actually make them on one of my synthesizers. All right, so let's see. of how I want it to sound my bass line. So I'm gonna go ahead and just play that in live for time's sake. Here, let's see now. So before I start structuring and arranging the whole thing, I'm gonna add a couple of more things into here. And what I'm actually gonna do is I'm just gonna like give myself a ton of space. And I'm gonna go ahead and noodle on my guitar a little bit. Now one of my absolute loves of my life that I have in my studio is a Fender Vibrolux vintage amp from 1967. I get crazy beautiful guitar tones out of there. So that's what I'm gonna go ahead and do right now.
Thank you, CRTNY. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. pedals on the floor so that's what you're not seeing all right let's go ahead and see what this feels like I was gonna try to improvise most of this and see if I get something cool out of it As you can probably tell, I would be more than happy to just sit here all day and jam over this groove. So I'm going to have to not do that so that I can actually finish this song with the 10 minutes that I have left. So let's see what I did here. I'm going to go ahead and send this to my global reverb. Just for the sake of time as well, I'm going to go ahead and actually use an, a, a digital synthesizer. And I'm going to go ahead and take those chords from my mini log. Ah. And well, I'll figure it out in a second. And I'll drag them onto my analog synth. What I want to do is add a little bit of like string sound. Ooh, 
that's harsh and bright. Go ahead and roll that off a little bit. Now the quickest way to make synth strings is to detune both the oscillators. I'm gonna put those up an octave. Yeah, one octave works. So let's go ahead and hear that now. I'm gonna break my rule just one more time today. I'm gonna to use my tall chorus plugin, which is free. Highly recommend getting this. Probably the dopest chorus plugin there is on the market. Here, it just adds that nice gooey feel. So the last thing I'm going to try to do is very quickly lay down some vocals and then we're going to do the world's fastest arrangement ever seen. Now, not the ideal situation because I'm using my pop filter over here for my uh, microphone that I'm talking with you guys with, but I think we'll be able to figure it out. And actually, as I say that, let me throw on my Chaotica eyeball just to make it that much better. This thing is amazing, by the way. If you have ever thought about getting one, I highly recommend it. I record fantastic vocals in my room with this thing all the time. All right. Let's see. Test, test, test. 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 Okay. Seems, Seems like, like there might be the tiniest bit of latency. But I, I think, think I'll, I'll be able to work around that. Let's go. Maybe I'll just EQ my voice on the way in. Let's see how's that sounding. I'm liking that. Okay.
I, so I was completely improvised those lyrics, so I, I apologize if they're truly terrible. Uh, I don't even know if you guys could hear them clearly, but they were coronavirus lyrics, let's just put it that way. So let's check it out. Lay, lay. There we go. So let's give it, those vocals the quickest mix they've ever seen. I don't have time to clean up all the noise in the background from my room. Lately, I've been losing my mind. I'm just going to open up my buffer size a little bit for this final minute and a half push that I have left. Lately, I've been losing my mind. Here all day. Wanna go how that it tell me no Pretty much is my time, and I'm gonna be honest, and you know, stop at 6 p.m. at exactly one hour. As you saw, there was a little bit of a little bit of a fritz uh, with the computer that scared the shit out of me, but we're doing okay. And so, let's go ahead and listen to what we made. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the buffer size completely, so you guys don't get any sort of crickly cracklies on your end. I think I'm going to do a little bit of an on-the-fly mix as we listen.
Complete track. So I want to be able to uh, spend some time now fielding any questions you may have had or you may continue to have about uh, workflow or about you know my arrangement process um, or you know really just any production questions. So just lob them into the chat, and uh, I'm more than happy you know to take another like 10, 15, 20 minutes to. Uh, you know, talk out some of your questions. So just drop them in there. And thank you guys for the kind words, by the way. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mind Money Magic. Thank you, Lie Society. How to make money in the music business? It's a very difficult question. Um, it, first of all, the thing that you have to realize is that how do you, okay, yes, yeah, so let's see. How to make money? How do you get off one loop? All right. We can definitely talk about that. What audio interface do you use? Yes, I do definitely have all my instruments connected at all times. So I'll just take these in order as they're coming in. All right, so in terms of making money in the music business, that's a, that could be a one-hour session in and of itself just talking about that. Um, here's the thing. There's no one way to make money in the music business, and there's tons of different ways you can make money in the music business. The question that you have to ask yourself is, do you want to be an artist? All right? Now, being an artist is the hardest way to make money in the music industry. And to be perfectly honest, it's actually not the most... Um, the, the most fruit, no, what would we say? You actually don't make the most money as an artist, right? Which people might think like, what? Isn't it like, isn't like Drake killing it? Now he's like an outlier, right? But most of the time it's uh, people who, you know, are running larger labels, uh, managers with multiple client, clients, stuff like that, that are really actually going to be making a lot of big bucks. So for you to make money in the music business, what you really want to try to do first is just hone your skills. Right? You cannot be worrying about selling your beats. Um, you can't be worrying about selling your beats yet or anything like that or trying to you know, send music to record labels until you have a product 
that is ready to be used, right? You can't, or you feel is like ready to be seen. Um, you can't be, you know, offering to mix people's records or something for money unless you're good at it, you know? Um, so really the thing is though, is that networking is the number one most important thing. And I wish I'd understood that when I was a little bit younger. I've only finally started to appreciate how, just how important networking is, just how important it is to get out to shows where people are in the scene that you want to be in, right? And the thing is, is that when you're starting out, right, you have to basically kind of just take whatever's given to you. You know, beggars can't be choosers is what they say. Um, and as you start to develop, right, and start making a little bit of money, the thing is, is that you definitely want the ways in which you're making money. There are two types of kind of scenarios, right? There's a one-time payout, and there is a, uh, a continuous like, payout, right? So a relationship that you get built. And so what you want to do is try not to put yourself into situations where you're getting these one-time payouts where it's like, oh, that was great. Thanks for coming to DJ. Here's 150 bucks or whatever it is, right? Thanks for mixing my song. Here's $500. What you want is this was great. We want you back. We want to keep paying you, right? So it's up to you to also be, you know, personable and be friendly. The honestly number one way to make it in the music business is just not be an asshole. There's so many people who are egocentric and self-centered, right? And so my really, my advice to you with how to make money, you know, is hone your skills and network and be friendly and just take any opportunity that's given, right? Always follow up with people, be immediately responsive, be as professional as possible. That's really, really the best advice that I can give you. Now on to that second question. How do you get off one loop? So as you probably noticed, right? I am building my own music from scratch, right? Now, it's important to, uh, if you're using loops, right, which is totally fine, there are plenty of people that do that, uh, it's really important to try to visualize what the end goal of the project is, right? So for me, in this particular moment in time, right, for this, this session that we did today, I knew that I had one hour. So some things that I might have spent more time on, I chose not to spend as much time on, right? And um, other things that, you know, I maybe normally wouldn't do, I decided to do. Um, and so I had to kind of prioritize what my goals were. And that's really the number one way to do this, is that in order to get out of the loop, what you want to do is, is you want to not focus on the loop, right? Don't worry about if it sounds good. Don't worry about if it sounds done or anything like that. Your, your loop is never going to sound done, right? It's just a loop. A loop is just the start of an idea. The, the concept is that, that really the, the main point here, main concept is that what you want to do is always be looking forward, always be trying to figure out how to grow it. One of the best ways to grow it is what I actually did earlier in the session, right? Was once I had enough things where I felt like, okay, I have an understanding of what the feeling of this record is, what the feeling of this track is, right? I'm going to drag it into my arrangement view and start forcing myself to generate more ideas by trying to arrange it, right? Like you witnessed how at the 808, it started out, you know, the filter was more open, but then as I started arranging, I was like, oh no, I got to close it. And so the thing is, is that it's very much like, you know, you have to learn from experience, like, but with your production, right? So you have to try to make the production start working in different ways. And then you realize, oh, this thing that I thought was so useful and that I wanted to happen every two bars isn't that useful, you know, or this thing that I thought that I wanted to have looping the whole time, maybe I should only have it loop for a little bit of period of time, right? So the key is to try to always push it, keep pushing it forward, keep pushing it forward, force yourself to make it longer, force yourself to try to fill in the blanks, right? A lot of what you probably saw me doing, or hopefully what you saw me doing was I was preparing sections that I wanted to get to in advance, right? And then based on what I was doing, based on the guitar that I played, right? Based on the new bass line that I added, stuff like that, um, I was able to then kind of figure out, oh, okay, let me fit these pieces together. Because the fact of the matter is, is that unless you write the whole song in advance, which is not a bad idea, by the way, really smart thing to do. If you are able to play the piano or able to play the guitar or any other instrument, and you're able to, you know, write a full song or a full arrangement, it's really easy then to kind of, you know, not be stuck in the loop because then you have a full song. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, main, the main thing here is you want to prioritize what's the most important thing at each moment in the production. And um, that is 
really at any given point in time the creativity, right? Don't worry about if your 808 sounds perfect. Don't worry about if the hi-hat should be panned negative 50 or negative 20. None of those things are important while you're producing and creating, right? All those decisions that make it sound finished, that make it sound alive are gonna come later. First, just get the track down. All right, so let's see. Next, we have the, uh, which what audio interface do you use, right? Okay, so I have the Apollo X6 from Universal Audio. Um, it's their newer line and it has six, <laughs> sorry, that's my girlfriend texting me. It has, uh, it has six inputs and what I have, the way I have it set up is that I also have a universal audio, um, four channel, um, preamp s section. So what that allows me to do is using an ADAC cable, I'm able to connect the actually the output of the uh, of my preamps into the back of my interface. And so what that does for me is it allows me to have everything plugged in at once. So I also have some other preamps that things are coming in on, but all my synths are plugged in there. Um, all of my preamps are coming into the Apollo. Everything is set up in my studio just so that I can turn it on, hit record, and get it all going. Um, I really highly recommend Universal Audio. They're an incredible company. But if you want to get more inputs, if you have you know more synths and stuff like that, more outboard gear, what I recommend doing is maybe getting like a Focusrite Octopri or look into getting an Antelope Audio system. They can give you a larger number of inputs for a slightly cheaper price. Uh, part of what you're paying so much money for with the uh, Apollo kind of brand with Universal Audio is you also get access to their plugins. You know, so it's a little bit of a a little bit of a squeeze, you know? Um, okay, now, the question of mix yourself versus having it done, same for mastering. I'll tell you what I do, right? So, I, you know, make a living uh, teaching, performing, and mixing and mastering, right? So, I people pay me not small amounts of money to mix their records, and, a, and I would say a pretty, like, normal rate for mastering for the, this day and age. Um, I get a solid rate. And the thing is, is that I don't master my own music. I refuse to. Now, I definitely mix my own music. And here's the thing with mixing. It's a very complex art form, but it's also a lot simpler than people think it is. The point of mixing is really just to make the record communicate the music in the most, in the most uh, clean way possible, right? You don't want anyone to notice the mix. Right? Not until they listen to it again and go, oh, wow, that sounds so nice, right? You don't want someone to go, oh, that snare is too loud, or oh, that vocal is too harsh. If that's what they're thinking, then you kind of already lost the battle. Really, you just want to make the mix, have the music sound good and be the way that it's meant to be, right? Now, obviously, that's easier said than done. So what I recommend to you to do is use reference mixes. Uh, what you, you can learn so much from taking a track that is really, really well produced and dragging it into the session and comparing it next to yours and then going, wow, that kick drum is so much louder and crisper. Okay, let me make my kick drum louder and crisper. Wow, those hi-hats are way quieter than I actually thought maybe mine have to be and then you turn them down, right? And from constantly A being, what you'll learn is the way that music is kind of supposed to sound. So, you know, I advise against paying money to get your music mixed unless you really are at a point where like you know you're going to be making money for the music, right? Where it's like the label is like, we are going to sign it. It just needs to be mixed a little better or something like that, right? Because um, the fact of the matter is a mix engineer is going to have a different vision for your song than you do probably, you know? Um, so I recommend just try to mix it to the best of your ability yourself. Use reference tracks. Use metering plugins from Isotope. Uh, those are really helpful. And, you know, just, just do your best. And the thing is, the thing that makes a great mix more than anything is good sound choices, right? So as you heard here, I didn't really have to mix anything. I just set levels. Um, I did a little bit of multiband compression on one thing. I EQ'd a little bit out here. But overall, this actually sounds pretty good. There's like just a little bit more that I would do, but nothing that crazy because the sounds that I chose were the right sounds. So that's the thing that you really want to focus on. And as far as the mastering, if you want it to sound professional, I recommend you don't do it yourself. That's just the fact of the matter. And this is coming from someone who masters professionally. I don't even master my own music. You just, you don't, you kind of lose sight of it. You're too biased. 
All right, what's my go-to vocal effects chain? Good question. Um, it really depends on what type of song I'm making. Uh, I love to use this plugin. I use two plugins in particular for my vocal effects for my own sound, which I didn't use in here today because we didn't really have time, and it wasn't it wasn't really the style. I use the little Alter Boy from uh, Splice. I'm sorry, <laughs> looking at the name of the project from uh, Sound Toys, and what that allows me to do is to, uh, to pitch down my vocal, and I use it usually in an audio effects rack configuration, so I blend it back in with my original vocal, and then this plugin from Eventide called the Dual Harmonizer is amazing. So, so cool. It's a really cool kind of futuristic delay kind of sound. So I love using those two. Um, but then I'll use some distortion and I pretty much use all my audio effects on sends, on return tracks. So that's really, really important. I recommend using audio effects, or uh, using all your vocal effects on return tracks. And I actually teach a class at 343 called Vocal Production where the entire class just talks about how to properly record and mix and process vocals. Okay, so what do you use for transitions? Uh, it depends. Hopefully I just use the music for transitioning, you know? And what I mean by that is hopefully the music is arranged in such a way that it just feels right moving from part to part. Now if it doesn't, I tend to be a big fan of reverb swells. So I don't like using crashes, I don't like using noise swells. Uh, those things feel gimmicky to me. They feel played out. So I always try to come up with an interesting way to move from section to section. I like to fade things into each other. Um, I like to have things send into a lot of reverb and kind of just suddenly, you know, the, the next section kind of just comes in out of the reverb. Um, I'm also a really big fan of just suddenly muting things and switching, right? So like mute everything on a 16th note or an 8th note and then move to the next section. Um. Mm. Okay, so... With regards to the phase issue, um, in terms of live tracking instruments, you only have to worry about phase when you're using more than one microphone. So I was only using one microphone the whole time. Uh, so the phase doesn't even really come into play. Um, phase becomes an issue when you have two microphones that are capturing the same source that are uh, happening at different, slightly different distances, right? So what happens is, is that the, uh, the audio signal comes into the, uh, comes into one of the microphones earlier than the other one or later than the other one, and then they're like out of alignment, right? Uh, so generally, you know, it's only gonna be when you're using multiple microphones you're gonna have that issue. Um, but if you do find that you're having that issue with multiple microphones, the easiest thing to do is to you, you flip the phase on one of the preamps. Uh, you can even do it in the DAW, you know? Uh, I think the Ableton Utility gives you the ability, oh, that was a rhyme, to uh, flip the phase. Yep, right here. So you could flip the phase if you wanted, right there. Um, but yeah, I mean, unless you're using multiple microphones, not an issue. Uh, I also have an experience uh, with as a mix, as a tracking engineer. I've worked in studios in the past, so I'm pretty solid at setting up microphones. Now, if you're asking specifically, like, how do I deal with phase in a mixing context? If it's given to me and there are phase issues. Um, Manual alignment's good, but also there's a plugin called Auto Align that basically solves mixing, uh, phasing issues for you. Right. So unfortunately, uh, from you, for the question from YouTube, um, there isn't any stock support for pitch correction in Ableton, which kind of blows my mind. I think people should, you know, uh, start telling Ableton that they want that because that's something that feels like it's really, really missing. Logic has that. Um, as far as mobile app, uh, I don't make music mobily. That's just me. Um, so I don't have an answer to that one. Ooh. Okay. So how to make room for kick and snare in a song. And sorry if I'm missing any of these. I'm going through here. Just making sure. Um, okay, yeah. So, making room for the kick and snare in a song, um, you know, there's like no, there's no one answer to that, unfortunately. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that low end is the hardest thing to, uh, and see you, Trazon, thank you. Uh, low end is the hardest thing to nail. Um, but basically, 
don't over compress your kick. That's one of the first things. Um, make sure that your bass and any other instrument that has low frequencies isn't at the fundamental frequency where your kick drum is. Right, so that either you can use side chain, duck it, or really a great way to do it is to use a very tight cue and pull out the fundamental frequency from your bass line of your kick drum. That makes room for it pretty cleanly. Uh, the other way to do it is to use panning. Right? So if, you have a lot, if your whole track is down the middle and your kick is down the middle, then you're, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be really, really hard to make room for the kick. But if you have things panned to the left, things panned to the right, things um, you know, with a lot of uh, reverb on them that are further back, then inherently there will just be more room. Um, and yeah, as far as the snare is concerned, uh, a transient shaper is a great way to just make a snare cut through a mix, kind of surefire, or you know, a subtle little boost at 2K or 3K will give you that nice presence. And where can we catch you? I would say follow me here. I'll, t I'll, I'll throw in my Instagram stuff because that's probably gonna be where you're gonna have the best shot. I'm not huge on Twitter, I'm not gonna lie. So I have two Instagrams for my two separate music projects. And the one that I just started today, which going forward is probably going to be more activity on that's like this, is, is uh, Sylvan Paul. Let me actually just double check that. That's my correct username. Sorry, underscore Sylvan Paul. So I'll, I'll put that back in. Yeah. Oh man, I can't. I spelled it wrong again. That's incredible. <laughs> Sylvan Paul. There we go. And again, I actually just released a new single today. So if you guys want to go check that out, it's on Spotify. It's called Fuck the Pain Away by Sylvan Paul. So I'll put that in there. What is the biggest problem about sidechain? Um, could you specify a little bit more what you mean? As you're typing that, I'll maybe try to guess a little bit, but um, I actually really try to avoid using sidechain as much as possible unless it's for creative purposes. I don't like to use it to solve a problem. Um, maybe people would you know, disagree with me on that, but uh, I'm a big fan of this plugin called Track Spacer. Really, really cool. And so I'll show you what it does about attack. Okay. Well, you want your attack to be as fast as possible. So it should always be 0.5 milliseconds because you want it to duck immediately. Um, but I recommend using this plugin if you want to actually you like not create the effective side chain, but use the technique of side chain to make more space for something. So I put this on my baseline. What I can do is, is I can select my sidechain input as the 808. And what this will do is, is it will actually allow me to duck the frequencies. Delay. Answer that in just a second. So what this does is, is it applies a negative EQ filter of the instrument coming in. So this is really, really useful. I actually use this instead of dynamic sidechain. So this is more like frequency-based sidechain. Um, in terms of instrument choice, I just recommend if you're making dance music, don't sidechain anything. I mean everything rather. Um, you want to, you know, sidechain your bass line so it pumps out of the way of the kick drum. And if you have like, you know, something that you want to pump, sidechain it. But overall, you actually shouldn't be sidechaining that many things because it's going to make it sound really, really unnatural. 
right? Side chain at the end of the day actually is compression. So what it's doing is it's just changing what triggers the threshold of the compressor, right? So normally what triggers the threshold is whatever is on the channel. But when you change it to a side chain, what happens is, is that the input coming, the signal coming in is now from another instrument, right? So you're now measuring the peak uh, from that other instrument. And so you're still applying compression technically. It's just the thing that's triggering the compression is something else. So I just recommend, you know, don't, don't overdo side chain. Use it on the bass if you want, you know, um, but, and on anything else you want to pump, but, but don't put it on everything. All right, well, I think that that's uh, probably, you know, answered most of your questions. And uh, I'm really, really grateful for you guys for tuning in, uh, you know, tonight to check this out wherever you were from, you know, all over the world or all over the country. Um, I really hope that you're staying safe and healthy and that your families are safe and healthy and um, that you, you know, enjoyed the music. And again, I just, you know, I want to thank Splice TV for hosting 343 Labs. Uh, once a week on these channels. It's been a really, really awesome opportunity for us. And if you're interested in learning more, you know, and taking more classes or taking class with me, please visit the 343 Labs website or, you know, hit me up on Instagram. You have my handle now um, to, to uh, with any questions or anything like that, you know? So it was great being a part of this, guys. And, uh, you know, stay safe.